Good afternoon. Um, we're going to change gears a little bit and uh, talk about something that actually the pediatric surgeons uh, and pediatric trauma care providers do a whole lot better uh, than we do on the adult side. And uh, we, the, the data that I'll present are from the adult side, but we can certainly learn something from our, uh, as an adult, primarily adult provider, we can um, certainly learn something from our pediatric colleagues. And that's the, um, the policy or the practice of allowing family to be present during resuscitation. And the resuscitation that I'm talking about is our trauma resuscitation in the trauma bay, uh, cardiac arrest that might happen on the ward or in the ICU, and extending that actually beyond resuscitation events to invasive procedures that our patients undergo, whether it's at the bedside, uh, whether it's in the emergency uh, department, uh, in the ICU, or uh, in a procedural area outside of the operating room. So I'm going to start. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. But I do think it is important that um, we pay attention not only to how we resuscitate our patients, what we do in the operating room, stopping the bleeding, all of those things that are near and dear to a trauma surgeon, trauma practitioner's heart, but we pay attention to what we can do for our patients and families after the resuscitation event. And from a family perspective, whether or not the patient you are treating, the patient that's immediately in front of you, survives. Grief after a resuscitation event is normal. It's going to happen. There is nothing that we can do to prevent that. And that may actually be true whether the patient survives or doesn't survive the resuscitation event. But complicated grief is not normal. And it turns out that there are several things that we can do to prevent complicated grief for families after a resuscitation event. And one of the primary of those is to allow the families to be present during a trauma or uh, cardiac arrest resuscitation. Turns out this is a pretty emotional topic. Uh, I presented this to a group of uh, cardiothoracic surgeons last year and was almost um, beaten out of the room and off the stage. Uh, the majority of the research that's been done in this area has been done by nurses. Very well done research has been done by nurses. Very little of it by physicians in any, um, in any arena. It started in 1992 where a woman in Michigan lost her husband who was a patrolman. And uh, despite the fact that many of his um, his coworkers came to try to advocate for her to be in the resuscitation bay with her husband who was dying. She, she was not allowed to be there. And the chaplain at Foot Memorial took this on uh, actually pretty reluctantly at first, and they were one of the first to have a family presence policy to allow families to be in the resuscitation bay. One of the huge misunderstandings of this topic is when people say families should be allowed to be there. They, um, people think that you are espousing that all families in all circumstances, regardless of situation, uh, regardless of whether it might or might not be appropriate, that the families can be there. No, that is not what family presence means. There are there are families, uh, there are people whose behavior is such that you would not allow them anywhere, and you certainly would not allow them in the resuscitation bee. They may be intoxicated, they may be aggressive, they may be emotionally unstable. But family presence means that you have a policy that allows for the family to be present if that is, um, if the family is deemed to be appropriate. And that, um, that really highlights the most important part of a family presence policy is the identification and training of, a, of facilitators. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So there's been a lot of survey research about families who have been present during a resuscitation event, um, as well as people uh, asked to think about whether they might want to be at a resuscitation event. 
And it turns out, and these are, these are families, um, they have no particular medical training, um, they run the gamut of um, ethnicity, they run the gamut of socioeconomic status. 75% of people w believe that they would like to be present if one of their loved ones was um, in a resuscitation, uh, needing resuscitation. 96%, almost unanimous, believe that they deserve the option. Whether or not they want to be there, they deserve uh, to be asked whether they want to be there. Of those who have been during, at a resuscitation event of a uh, close family member, 94% would make the same decision again. And 100%, again, of those that have been in a resuscitation event believe that everything possible was done. And this is really important because one of the, again, emotional concerns of, from providers is the legal implications or are the legal implications. And 100%, and this is over and over and over again when uh, people have been surveyed. From a resuscitation event perspective, there's not a lot of data, as you might expect, from patients. But there are data from patients who have had a procedure done and have had a family member there uh, with them during the procedure. And the survey data suggests that patients are more comforted they feel that the person uh, there with them reminds the providers that the patient is actually a person and not um, the person in room 32 who happens to need a central line or an LP or uh, whatever else uh, goes on. And that overall there's an enhanced connection and a positive impact on care. These are some of the uh, things that the family needs uh, to to prevent that grief from going from normal grief to complicated grief. And again, these are things that allowing the family presence option does and does relatively easily and relatively seamlessly. Uh, this practice, the, the practice of having a family presence policy is uh, well vetted with many institutions that, um, and organizations that uh, those of you in the audience may belong to, the ENA, the American Heart Association, the American Association of Pediatrics, uh, and ha has been endorsed by these associations for quite some time, by the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, um, should be given the option, again, not they have to be there, but should be given the option. And not only be given the option, but done so under a policy so that if you just decide to take a family member to the bedside, you're actually covered by policy and procedure and you're doing it in a way that is known to improve outcome rather than put you or the patient or the family member at risk. As well as the Canadian Critical Care Society, this is the most recent society that has actually signed on uh, to suggest that this is an important part of our day-to-day -day uh, care of both patients and families. These are some of our concerns as health professionals. And I put this first to show um, not only the concerns, but follow this then with some data that dispels some of these concerns and myths. So it can be uncomfortable to watch a family member um, be with a patient as they undergo resuscitative events that are not successful. It can be very personally uncomfortable. There's a concern that the family is not going to understand what we are doing as a healthcare team trying to resuscitate uh, this patient. Um, but then there's also a concern that they're gonna understand it enough that they might know when we do something wrong. And again, the legal concern. Turns out there is uh, that families aren't able to process uh, all of what happens, and all they see time and time again is a team that is working together, working as hard as they can uh, to save their loved one's life. And then this uh, speculating harm aspect, thinking that what the family member is seeing is so 
gory, so out of the norm that it is going to stick with them and give them nightmares and perhaps cause some type of uh, PTSD. Again, I'm going to show you some data that uh, very quickly dispels this uh, myth. So these are some data um, that we collected in Milwaukee after having implemented our family presence program. They're uh, qualitative data. Uh, I have representative quotes. We did not get a single negative response uh, interviewing uh, family after family after family. Uh, we were not able to do this in a prospective manner because the um, family presence policy had been in effect for so long. What I remember the most was how, I am, how impressed I was with the trauma team. They were professional, efficient, and made sure the patient was taken care of. It was helpful to be able to be there. It helped my son not to worry. I needed to be there. It was important to me that she knew I was there. I was grateful to be able to comfort my son. I needed to reassure him and tell him not to worry about the car. So those were qualitative data. They're nice. They make you feel good. Uh, these are the most compelling and convincing data to show that we actually can make a difference, again, preventing that normal grief from um, being converted to complicated uh, grief. This is a study out of France. 15 pre-hospital EMS units were randomized by unit um, to uh, when patients who were undergoing CPR, their relatives were randomized to either standard practice, which was to take the family member outside of the room so that they were not able to be there during the uh, resuscitation, or they were invited to observe, again, with a facilitator whose only job was to take care of that family member. They measured outcomes 90 days after the resuscitation event and then follow up, uh, followed up one year after the resuscitation event. And this follow-up was done by a trained psychologist, um, and they're administering questionnaires by phone. So these are the data. And uh, the study is from the New England Journal, and they did both an intent to treat analysis and then whether um, the family member actually um, was in the arm they were randomized to. The impact of events scale, the presence of PTSD, the symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of depression, and receiving newly uh, prescribed psychotropic drugs all were less in family members who had uh, observed a resuscitation event. Statistically significant all, uh, in all cases, both uh, for the intent to, to treat, but more significant for those that actually observed the resuscitation event. And then at one year, still significant, uh, less major depression, fewer psychotropic drugs, and less complicated grief, with an equivalent number of suicide attempts, uh, independent of which group they were in. Very hard data uh, supporting the family presence during a resuscitation event. Some more data, uh, these are data from Parkland comparing the foot memorial data when Parkland was considering a family presence policy. Uh, when this policy was actually implemented, there were lower bereavement scores similar to the, um, uh, to the JABRE study three and nine months after the resuscitation event. So nurses are more comfortable with this than physicians, and uh, faculty physicians are more comfortable than residents. But even the faculty physicians that weren't that comfortable felt that it was beneficial and thought that they should continue. And the residents clearly needed some more education and experience. The uh, important considerations when you uh, start developing this policy are that there does need to be a family facilitator. The degree of that family facilitator, whether they're a physician, nurse, social worker, chaplain, uh, is, is not important at all but they need to be trained to provide a family assessment and to make that assessment and to be able to say, yes, this family, no, not this family. 
It should be uh, a provider decision. Uh, the, the facilitator needs to be able to prepare the family, stay involved with the family, and then, uh, if appropriate, institute a bereavement protocol. So there is some connection with the facilitator, uh, with the team, with, um, after the resuscitation event. So um, this outlines some of the uh, aspects of the family presence policy that we implemented. Uh, patient care remains the priority. If that becomes uh, threatened, then the family member has to leave, taken out by the facilitator. The healthcare team, the physician and nurse, helps evaluate suitability if appropriate. The patients have to agree if they're um, awake and talking. Two family members only. The facilitator, again, has to remain there. And if you have a resuscitation bay that has multiple bays, if there are multiple resuscitation events because of uh, HIPAA and privacy, the family has to leave. If the family is difficult, the facilitator leads them out. If the family is acceptable, then the facilitator remains with the family. So in summary, our patients really are, and our patients' families are at high risk of a complicated grief response. There's nothing we can do about normal grief but there are things that we can do to help decrease the risk of conversion, facilitate visit visitation, clear communication, and family presence. It uh, has proven benefits. The concerns that we as healthcare members have raised um, have turned out to be unrealized. And making a family presence policy a routine part of care takes a conscious effort and multidisciplinary team dedication. Thank you very much for your attention.